everyone. My name is Christina Van Sickle, and I'm the Director of Professional Practice at the College. I'd like to thank you for joining us for this educational session, War, Climate Change, and the Loss of Home, Practice Implications for Social Workers and Social Service Workers, led by Brie Ockeson. Before I introduce and welcome our speaker for today's session, I'd like to go over a few housekeeping items. As part of our ongoing efforts to leverage technology to increase accessibility, all parts of AMED, including this educational session, will have live captions. To turn on the captions, click the Show Captions button below to view our live captions in either French or English. If you require assistance at any point during this year's AMED, there's also a live support desk found at the bottom left of your screen. You can click on the pink chat bubble and you'll be connected with our live support should you require any assistance. Following this year's AMED, we invite you to complete a post-event feedback form to share your experience of this two-day virtual event. The feedback form will be sent to you via email after it's the two-day event, so please be on the lookout for that. Your feedback is important to us and will assist us in planning next year's event. Once you complete the feedback form, you will have access to a link to the Certificate of Participation, which you can fill out and print for your records. Your attendance at AMED, including this participation in this session, can count towards the completion of your Continuing Competence Program, also known as the CCP. As a reminder, there will be an opportunity to ask questions at the end of the presentation. Members can submit their questions through the chat feature to the right of the screen in the virtual portal. I'll be reading the questions aloud for Brie to respond. We will do our best to answer as many questions as time permits and appreciate your understanding that we may not be able to get to all of the questions. In order to accommodate questions from as many members as possible, we'd ask that you limit yourself to one question only. Now let's begin the educational session. I'm so pleased to introduce to you all to Brie Ockeson. Brie is the Canadian Research Chair Tier 2 in Global Adversity and Wellbeing, Associate Director of the Centre for Research on Security Practices, and an Associate Professor at Wilfrid Laurier University's Faculty of Social Work. She has degrees in Sociology, Public Health, Social Work from Columbia University, and a PhD from McGill University, where she was a Vanier Scholar and received several national awards for her doctoral research with war-affected families. Her current research focuses on families impacted by extreme adversity and the biopsychosocial impact of domicide. In addition to her research, she is a social worker at the Global Psychiatric Ep Epidemiology Group in New York City. Today's educational session will highlight the reality that on a global scale, the first two decades of the 21st century have been characterized by an overwhelming number of social challenges related to ills such as poverty, war, political instability, and climate change. Poverty, war, and general political instability have been linked to climate change, considered by many the most consequential global threat of the century. A scarcity of water, food, and livelihoods caused by climate change encourage desperate populations to challenge their governments, thereby increasing the risk of inter- and intrastate conflicts. Amplified natural disasters related to climate change continue to displace vulnerable populations at an unprecedented rate. Bree's presentation will note that these adversities have left nearly 80 million people displaced from their homes. Combined, these pressing and overlapping forms of adversity greatly impact the well-being of individuals, families, and communities around the world. In order to address these critical issues, Bree's presentation notes that we must encourage the next generation of social workers and social service workers to tackle these realities at the micro, meso, and macro level. This presentation will provide social workers and social service workers with the context, approaches, and tools to understand the relationship between climate change and war with a specific focus on the biopsychosocial implications of loss of home as a result of disaster. Please join me in welcoming Brie Ackeson. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here and to uh, be presenting at this conference. Um, very, uh, I think that this is a very important topic that I'm really happy to share. And it hasn't been talked about a lot, so 
Um, what I'd like to do first is, is kind of give you an overview of what the um, talk will be about. So first of all, I want to kind of emphasize how uh, social workers, social service workers, we all believe that everything is interconnected. That's one of our values. And so I'm going to be talking to you about things that are happening in faraway places. But as social workers and social service workers, we know that the events that happen in other places actually impact us here in Canada and in Ontario. So um, to repeat a little bit of what, what was said before, you know, the first two decades of, of this century have been characterized by this overwhelming number of challenges, poverty, war, political instability, climate change, and environmental degradation. And, um, <laughs> and today, we have nearly 80 million people who've fled their homes and countries. And that's due to things like poverty, due to war, due to things like climate change. Among the devastating consequences, displacement ruptures families, protective systems, and the physical and, um, physical and social environments that are necessary for healthy development and well-being. So protective social systems are things like families, peers, communities, governance structures. Those are all damaged and challenged within the context of displacement. And also physical environments. Homes are destroyed, schools are destroyed, schooling is interrupted, um, neighborhoods are raised, and hospitals are inaccessible. So there's lots of different um, elements that are impacted by displacement, by um, war and conflict, and people leaving their homes for certain reasons. COVID-19 is obviously an issue. Um, over the past year, we've been encountered with COVID-19 and the impacts. And COVID-19 has really impacted a lot of us personally, professionally, um, but we don't really know how the pandemic will affect the trajectory of today's major conflicts around the world, um, if at all. The pandemic has precipitated a global economic crisis. Certain countries are in crisis, driving an additional 150 people below the, the extreme poverty line. So we are noticing that there is impact on poverty due to, due to COVID-19. Um, and then the other thing that's interesting is one, one uh, research center found that um, COVID-19 might actually impact war by creating ceasefires because people are dealing with COVID and not dealing with armed conflict. But that was a short-lived dream. It actually didn't. So armed conflict has actually continued to um, move forward despite um, COVID-19 um, uh, you know, impacting every community around the world. Um, although there's no direct correlation between income level and conflict, there is evidence that more violence is likely during periods of economic volatility. So we do see when there's economic downturn, when there's increase in poverty, there is actually increase in violence um, out of desperation, governments trying to grapple with, with um, dissatisfied populations and so forth. So in addition to mass numbers of displacement um, and increased poverty related to COVID-19, climate change actually poses another significant threat to the world. And I know, I imagine most of you who are listening today um, know about climate change, know that it's a big issue, um, and have been maybe beat over the head about how important it is that we address it. What I want to talk about today is how climate change is impacting really vulnerable populations and how that connects to war, poverty, and other forms of adversity. So the most vulnerable populations are already feeling the effects and dealing with the fallout of climate change. So we think of climate change as something in the future, although now I think it is a bit more, people are feeling it is a bit more pressing in the present time. Um, but I think it's, it's very much impacting people in a really, really, uh, adverse way around the world, and we're, we're, we don't, we're not really seeing that uh, in the news yet. We're not seeing these implications as, as strongly, but I want to emphasize it um, in our profession. So there's a connection between uh, the existential climate crisis and other pressing social challenges, such as war, injustice, and poverty. And um, as a profession, social workers, social service workers have a professional and ethical responsibility to address these new and ever-changing urgent issues. And I think we're really good at that as a profession. We do respond to the, the pressing issues that we're dealing with today. This is something that I call the war climate nexus. So it's the relationship between war and climate change. And it's actually a lot more complex than just saying that climate change causes war. We can't really say that and it hasn't been strongly proven that there is that, that cause and effect relationship. It's actually a lot more circu circuitous and context specific. So some, a term that's used a lot with climate change is that climate change is a threat multiplier. 
It adds stress to already stressed societies, and it serves as a catalyst for conflict, violence, and war. So there's increased inst instances of extreme weather events, things like drought, heat wave, hurricanes, and flood, and that can actually exacerbate food insecurity, water scarcity, resource competition. It disrupts families' livelihoods, and it spurs migration. So the struggle, you have the struggle for basic resources like housing or water um, and fertile land, and that might contribute to potential future conflicts. Um, this is a, uh, uh, an image that was developed by the Notre Dame Global Adaptation Initiative. And um, they do a really good job of, of kind of identifying the connection between climate change and um, conflict. So they found that countries that are already mired in conflict, so countries that are dealing with armed conflict, with um, civil war, things like that, tend to be disproportionately affected by climate change. So they're less able to cope with climate change because their ability to adapt is actually weakened by the conflict. So this index identified 20 countries that were most vulnerable to climate change according to the country's ability to improve resilience. And they found that 60% of the 20 countries were actually currently at that moment experiencing armed conflict. So there is that connection, but again, it's not a cause and effect. It's a lot more circuitous and a lot more um, compli complicated. I'll just give you two examples. One example is from Yemen. Um, the current war in Yemen um, can be traced back to the Arab Spring, Arab Uprising of uh, 2011. And the war in Yemen has been characterized as a politically motivated competition for power. But there's underlying tensions related to scarcity of water, so scarcity of resources, that is actually um, creating more tensions and, and contributing to the conflict there. Another example is Mali. Since 2012, Mali has faced political instability and over 300,000 people have fled their homes. In addition to the violence that people are experiencing, Mali has faced increasing uh, temperatures alongside frequent periods of drought and flooding. And this has further displaced people and contributed to high rates of morbidity and mortality. So in Mali, you have families that are moving south where there is pasture for their animals. So there's fields, there's grass um, where they don't have it currently. So they're migrating to the south in that case. But this really creates further tensions uh, between the communities over who has access to fertile land and water. And this can escalate localized violence. So if you have a lot of people from outside coming into your community and you have fertile land, you're very um, protective of that land, uh, protective of those resources, and so that can spur conflict. At the same time, conflict and instability are contributing to climate change through increased instances of environmental degradation. And this, I think, is something we don't talk about as much. This environmental degradation is this process through which um, the natural environment is compromised. And it can be an entirely natural process, or it can be accelerated or caused by human activities. If you think of a riverbank uh, and you know, there's natural environmental degradation as the river winds its way, um, you know, winds, its, winds through its path. Um, but in other cases, you have a riverbank and you have housing that's on the side of the riverbank and you have people using the water and it's actually making the riverbank you know, um, change shape and that would be considered environmental degradation, right? So there's both natural process and human process. So there's a range of ways that environmental degradation is related to conflict. One is militaries, and militaries are notorious for engaging in environmentally damaging practices. They build bases on ecologically important areas, so oftentimes big expansive areas that could be uh, reserves for animals or for, or for pastures. Um, they create chemical and noise pollution, and they dump, um, there's been instances of dumping surplus munitions and waste into the, into the ocean. During conflict, landscapes can be damaged from pollution, weapons, conflict rubble, uh, when, especially when you have scorched earth tactics. So when you have a, a conflict where um, communities are just destroyed in a scorched earth pattern. Um, so that's, you know, that kind of uh, tactic is aimed to destroy anything that might be useful to the enemy, so, so to speak. And it leaves large swaths of land completely obliterated. 
Um, these tactics of war are actually so heinous to the environment that they've been labeled environmental war crimes. The term environmental war crime is becoming a lot more, um, uh, being used more. Um, increased access to small arms and light weapons has also led to increases in things like hunting and poaching, which harms wildlife conservation. And that actually has an impact on the people and the communities where that wildlife is living. Um, as conflict displaces large numbers of people from their homes, camps, refugee camps, settlements are hastily created. They're created without much attention to um, environmental issues or much attention to what the communities actually want and need. Um, there might be no access to, to sanitation or water or waste management, and so that can actually overflow and uh, cause a lot of damage to the community. And I'll show an example of that in a bit. And then displaced families might be constrained to gather local resources, such as firewood, in order to cook. And this puts additional pressure on the environment. Before long, there's no resources available for these families. And it illustrates how environmental degradation connected with conflict has really vast implications for people as well as for ecosystems. So as social workers and social service workers, we're interested in the human consequences of these kinds of crises. So what are the human consequences? Um, I've alluded to a few of them in the previous slides. Um, amplified natural disasters related to climate change intersecting with political conflict continues to displace people at an unprecedented rate. So the number of those displaced worldwide has continued to rapidly increase over the years. Every year, it gets a bit higher and higher. Um, in 2019, 25% um, of the 33.4 uh, million new internal displacements across 145 countries were due to conflict and violence. And 75% of those new internal displacements were actually due to disasters, which is a, a, a big shift in, in the, the demographics of, of uh, who is being displaced or why people are being displaced, I should say. Um, individuals, families, and communities oftentimes are reluctantly, uh, reluctantly, they reluctantly flee. They, they don't want to actually leave their homes of origin. Most people who are leaving really want to stay in their communities, but they can't stay. Um, and that's because of impending violence or a range of hardship, such as food insecurity, resulting from this war climate nexus that we're talking about today. Um, there's also something called mixed migration. And the war climate nexus really contributes to mixed migration or cross-border movements of people, including refugees, victims of trafficking, and just people who are seeking better lives and opportunities. And oftentimes, uh, people are um, a mixture of all of those things. They might be fleeing, uh, as, as fleeing a conflict setting, but they also might be uh, fleeing to seek a better life and opportunity as well. So mixed migration is really a hallmark of what I'm talking about today, of this war climate nexus. And it's becoming common, more common, and it really complicates how we, as social workers and social service workers, address forced migration. So it's not Oh, it's not just refugees who are coming in to Canada, for example, based on the Refugee Convention. It's actually people who are trying to get to Canada or trying to move to another country, um, trying to flee their country of origin due to um, a, a, a mixture of different kinds of reasons. So while those who flee their countries due to what's called a well-founded fear of persecution, which is the language that's used in the 1951 Refugee Convention, um, the designation, legal status, and rights of those who are displaced by environmental factors are unclear and contested. So this leads to increased vulnerability. The IOM a few years ago said that people migrating for environmental reasons don't fall squarely within any one particular category provided by the existing international legal framework. And that international legal framework is what protects them, right? So terms such as environmental refugee have no legal basis in international refugee law. There's a growing consensus among concerned agencies that the use of the term environmental refugee is to be avoided. These terms are misleading and they could potentially undermine the international legal regime for the protection of refugees. So we're at a bit of an impasse in terms of how do we define populations who are fleeing due to mixed migration or due to climate change. There's no international legal framework that protects those populations, which is a challenge for us as social workers and social service workers. 
So who is the most vulnerable? And this won't be as surprising for a lot of you. Um, already, populations that are already vulnerable are even more vulnerable because of the climate war nexus. So women, especially pregnant and nursing mothers, children, particularly, particularly children under the age of five, elderly persons, uh, persons with disabilities, um, and other marginalized groups are more burdened by the intersection of violent conflict, climate change, and environmental degradation. Those most vulnerable are those who are most likely to lack resources to reconstruct homes and communities. They're therefore forced to migrate to survive. And as these populations move, they face additional struggles as their safety and status may be further marginalized during their journey to seek safety. Once those displaced as a result of all the issues I'm talking about today, the war climate nexus and so forth, have a place of temporary or permanent refuge, they may still struggle with a myriad of challenges. When we think of a refugee camp, uh, we think of it as a short-term solution for displaced population. It's a place like this you see in the photo here, where people stay temporarily and then they eventually go back to their homes. Uh, but camps for displaced populations uh, tend to transition into these semi-permanent cities. We're seeing a, a lot more kind of long-term camps, long-term settlements. And the average duration of a camp actually stands at over 10 years now, uh, which is, is remarkable. Um, conditions in refugee camps are extremely challenging for, for children and families and for, for all these vulnerable populations. Um, there's often substandard sanitation. There might be scarce electricity. Organized crime and violence also can contribute to this insecure environment. And reports indicate that displaced populations face greater risk of war-related mental health conditions, or we could say displacement-related as well. Um, there's more instances of early marriage. Uh, families might uh, decide to uh, try to arrange a marriage for a daughter who's, who can be pretty young, right, who would be, would be considered early marriage um, just because they're unable to support that family and they think that she'll be better supported if she's married to someone else and married into someone else's family. So you have early, uh, instances of early marriage in those cases. And increased r rates of child labor. And one thing that we don't talk about a lot um, in, in the research is the, that displaced populations face another challenge in camp context, which is boredom and rolelessness. Um, so in my work working with refugee populations around the world, this is something that really comes up. It's we have nothing to do. Um, I, I, you know, I, I had this job in my home country and I don't have that job now. And, and it's a, really, a real sense of desperation, sense of depression um, that a lot of families are facing because of that boredom and rolelessness. I want to give one example um, that's current right now um, from the Rohingya population in Bangladesh. Um, so my example of the Rohingya in Bangladesh illustrates the complexity and also the insidiousness of the war climate nexus. The Rohingya, uh, for those of you who might not know, is a stateless ethnic group and it's one of the most persecuted minority groups in the world. Um, they have experienced an ethnic cleansing campaign consisting of hor horrific acts of violence. Um, they've been subjected to the burning of their homes, their villages, and sexual violence and, and, um, and killings at the hands of the Myanmar military and the local Buddhist population. Um, recently, in August 2018, over 700,000 Rohingya had fled their homes or what remained of their homes, as many of their homes had been burned um, and destroyed. Um, and they fled um, Myanmar's Rakhine state, where many had lived for generations. The majority of these individuals sought refuge just across the border in southern Bangladesh. And it led to one of the largest and the fastest movements of people in recent history. Bangladesh, before the influx of, of Rohingya in 2018, was considered to be ground zero for the global climate crisis. Um, so there were lots of issues in Bangladesh with extreme weather events displacing populations, um, you know, national Bangladeshis there. And Bangladesh is the only country actually officially accepting uh, Rohingya refugees. So today there's approximately one million displaced Rohingya living in southern Bangladesh um, in the overcrowded camps. I'll show you a picture of it and it's pretty remarkable what one of the camps looks like. 
So many of the camps in southern Bangladesh are actually the size of large cities, extremely sprawling and extremely dense. But they have none of the basic infrastructure to support the sizable number of families who are displaced there. The population density for most camps is less than 15 square meters per person. So imagine 15 square, square meters per person, which is actually far below the, the basic minimum standards of 30 to 40 meters per person that's required um, under um, standard housing for refugee settings, under international humanitarian guidelines. So extremely, extremely dense. Uh, most families live in temporary bamboo structures covered with only a plastic sheet. Uh, the Bangladesh flood floodplains and hillsides are the only sites that the Bangladeshi government has made available for Rohingya families to build their homes. But these sites are really highly vulnerable to acute climate-related disasters. Um, I was just reading that the Bangladeshi government is trying to get the uh, Rohingya refugees to move to an island setting. They're, they've created this island and they've put amenities on the island, um, you know, clinics and stores and, and, and housing for these families. And none of the Rohingya want to go because they know that that island is extremely vulnerable to, um, to extreme weather, so monsoons, flooding. So they are very, very scared to move to this island where they might be subjected to further displacement or their homes being destroyed again due to weather, due, due to climate change. So aid organizations have argued that monsoon and cyclone floods, which peak between May and October in the region, have the potential to submerge up to one third of all the Rohingya camps. And that's not just including the island that I talked about. So this means that Rohingya refugees are even more vulnerable to bureaucratic policies that will make them vulnerable to losing their homes yet again. So kind of losing home multiple times over. Uh, furthermore, the large and the quick influx of Rohingya refugees from Myanmar into Bangladesh has led to environmental degradation, both within the camps and in the surrounding communities. Uh, research has found that over 2,000 2, hectares of forest have been lost in just one region where the camps are set up. Um, there is an expansion of one of the camps, uh, the Kutupalong camp, that has been expanding to accommodate the growing number of refugees. And it led to, an, to a blockage of an important corridor for endangered Asian elephants. So it left 45 elephants stranded, and it amplified the human-elephant conflict. Um, so the elephants survive, uh, that have survived face dwindling resources because there's high rates of deforestation, because Rohingya families are cutting down firewood to survive. They're cutting down firewood to, to make food for their families. Um, and so you have this intersection between nature and humans, the elephants and the Rohingya population, and um, it, it causes a lot of stress, strain, and, and uh, problems and conflict within that region. The human impact of the Rohingya displacement is also pretty dire. Um, the environment within which Rohingya refugees live plays a major role in their well-being, as it plays a role in all of our well-being. Um, there's acute malnutrition rates that remain high. Aggregating fa uh, aggravating factors including uh, poor water sanitation facilities, substandard housing, and the rainy seasons. And one study found that the prevalence of negative mental health outcomes Things like depression, stress disorders, suicidal ideation among Rohingya um, in Bangladesh is actually mediated by um, daily environmental stressors, such as the quality of their housing and the exposure to the elements. So that's the, I wanted to give you that background of what's going on in the world. And these are really just like so few examples of hundreds of thousands of examples that are happening around the world of the, the connection between climate change and, and war and poverty. But I want to talk about, uh, what I want to talk about now is the role of social work and social service work. So we can kind of end on that, you know, what can we do about all these really, you know, horrible things that are happening around the world. Um, I'm going to, I might say, if I say social work, I'm also including social service work and, and vice versa. I might also say we, because I am a practicing social work, and so we'll say it kind of as a, as a collective we as well. So, so our response as a profession to the war climate nexus is really as complicated uh, is, is, is as complicated as trying to resolve the challenge itself. So the complexity of the issue dares us to think beyond unidimensional interventions that may only serve as a temporary solve to affected populations. 
What we need are really major efforts, significant systemic and structural changes, political will, competent government support, human and financial investment, technical knowledge, and a shift in our mindset as well. And I think, I think uh, social work and social service work is perfectly suited to spearhead these major efforts. So I want to talk a little bit about um, how we can make these changes or how we can, per how can, how we can address this nexus, how we can address and, and work with these vulnerable populations. And I'll move a bit between the micro, meso, and macro, um, but I want to frame it through theory, practice, and policy. So I'm going to start with theory first. So our profession requires this kind of new level of theoretical thinking for social workers and social service workers to address the adversities faced by these populations. So while, it, while attuning ourselves to the person and environment model, we've traditionally emphasized the social environment over the physical environment. We tend to think of the person and environment, but we think of it as it, the person is in the center and then impacted by uh, these systems around, around that person. And I think I would challenge us to think about how the physical environment plays a role and how, if we can emphasize the physical environment in this case. So if the physical environment starts being considered, the use of an expanded person and environment model can actually push us to recognize that everything's connected. And it's a really useful approach when considering the nexus that I've talked about today and its myriad impacts on vulnerable populations. Uh, Meredith Powers, social worker down in, in North Carolina, um, a social work professor now, um, she says that life on Earth is not just composed of interactions between humans, but it also includes the connectedness of humans, entire ecosystems, and the physical environment. So this expanded person and environment framework can really help us to move beyond, beyond just focusing on trauma, which is very important. And help us to move beyond just individual focused models, which are also important, to looking at place-based community focused models that might be more responsive to addressing environmental issues and the connections to war and violence. Along this vein, social work and social service work has really done a good job of engaging theoretically in environmental issues and expanding educational approaches so that the environment has become a part of the discourse. And to this end, uh, we have, over the last maybe, I'm not sure, maybe five or ten years, we've done a better job of drawing from indigenous perspectives and knowledge to better understand the relationship between humans, non-humans, and the environment. But I would challenge us to push even further in this way. Um, again, Meredith Powers and her colleagues suggest that social work education, uh, social service worker education, embrace what's known as a biophilia framework, which involves an awareness of the interconnectedness of nature and understands the role of humans as only one aspect in nature. So one aspect of many, right? In relation to the war climate nexus, the biophilia framework really helps to uncover how the damaging and uh, damage and destruction of the environment can impact humans physically, psychologically, and spiritually. And it can impact individuals and communities all the way through the, the micro, meso, macro levels. Consequently, theories informed by indigenous knowledge and the biophilia framework have the potential to help us to engage with holistic, collective, and complex theories that provide a foundation for effective practice and advocacy. Turning to practice, um, as a profession, we're committed to supporting the most vulnerable. That's what we do, right? That's our that's 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 our our calling and our our goal, right? Is supporting the most vulnerable. And the most vulnerable in this case uh, that we're talking about are those impacted by war climate nexus. Um, in context of disaster and crisis, actually local social workers and social service workers might be employed by humanitarian development agencies. So this is something we, we sometimes forget that in the communities, all these communities that I've talked about, there, there are social workers, there are social service workers who are doing the work, who are working with the communities, who are helping people who are vulnerable. Um, but they also are impacted themselves by what's going on in that context. Um, so we have, to be, we have to kind of move beyond what's visible and expand our assessments to include past experiences, current capacities, and future goals. So we can better understand the experiences of those who are impacted, those who are most vulnerable, those of our 
uh, brothers and sisters who are in the field, who are working in those communities, who are of those communities, by drawing from our commitment to, to human rights-based approaches and drawing from our commitment to working with the most vulnerable, to um, you know, working with people where they're at. So we can be involved in a range of crisis practice activities, things like providing psychosocial activities um, to families, coordinating shelters um, to populations who are displaced, uh, whose temporary homes are destroyed during a climate-related event, such as a flood or monsoon, and also reunifying family members who are separated while fleeing their countries of origin to seek safety. I was just reading a story of, um, of about, or not a story, <laughs> a research paper on, uh, on children who were impacted by home demolitions, by their homes being destroyed in the context of war. And um, the home being destroyed was very impactful for these, these young people, these children. But what was most impactful was that they ended up being separated from their families in that case. So we have to see all of these interconnections and how they are related and, and how we can address those things. Um, additionally, it's important to note that, uh, as I said before, that we also are impacted. So our, our profession, people within our profession are in those communities and they're thereby experiencing some of the same issues of the populations we're serving. So by assessing and addressing the war climate nexus, we can learn to recognize and support people's human rights. That is, the right to not be violated, the right to migrate, the right to resettle, or to go back to one's homeland and to pursue a safe and secure future. So something to think about as we're working with these populations. Uh, we also play an important role in helping those who are affected by the war climate nexus to resettle, rebuild, and reestablish their lives. So the most effective intervention that can be taught to us as a profession um, are those that promote connection and socialization to forge new links and to help reestablish a sense of community, uh, which may have been seriously compromised or even destroyed in the course of violence or disaster. So if one is separated from their community or their community is destroyed due to, due to conflict or due to climate change, what's, uh, I think, one of our major responses as a profession would be to help these individuals, help these communities to reestablish a sense of community, reestablish a sense of, of connection with others. In addition to facilitating collective healing, encouraging face-to-face -face interactions among people through community organization methods um, can help to reestablish that com those community ties and reconnect to place and home. Uh, so if people are not able to return back to their home communities, back to their home structures, one thing we can do as a profession is how can, how can we help them to develop a sense of home away from home as best as, as we can. Communities are really rich resources um, for healing and recreating home. And so we need to cultivate that sense of community um, as, as social workers and social service workers. So... Uh, Participatory approaches, community organize, organizing approaches can really ensure the meaningful participation of those who are impacted by the climate war nexus. And it has the capacity to contribute to more powerful healing processes. Um, so uh, we're able to kind of facilitate that resilience within communities. And the, the third part of practice would be um, the importance of voice and storytelling. And I always like to talk about the importance of voice and stories among these populations because even today in my presentation, I didn't really talk a lot about, or I didn't really give you an example of an individual story. And those individual stories are so powerful and they have so much meaning and we tend to just look at the bigger picture. I give you the statistics, I give you the number of, you know, this many people have been displaced or large numbers have, have you know, lost their homes. But the individual stories are so powerful and I think it's one of uh, social work and social service workers' um, greatest tool is to harness the power of voice and storytelling. Um, so these populations uh, that we work with are, they have their individual and collective assets such as agency, resilience, and the potential for healing. And all these things can be uncovered via storytelling. Storytelling can be as simple as asking an individual, a family, or community to share their history, share your experiences, or share your dreams of the future. In the research that I do with, with refugee populations, I always ask about their past experiences, their current experiences, and their dreams for the future. 
And they end up telling me these stories that are so powerful for them and um, I think that are very valuable in terms of healing as well. Um, we can use multimedia approaches, so things like audio recordings, photography, video, uh, writing, drawing, so many different approaches to um, use as a mechanism to elicit stories and to um, help the populations that we're working with share their stories. Um, so it can be really, it can be used as a memento for the person who's, who's telling the story or to share with others as a means of community building, education, and advocacy. When I talk with families, um, I usually talk with the whole family, so mom, dad, children, and the parents will start telling the story of their home that they've lost. And the children will sit in rapt attention listening to these stories because those stories are the stories of their family and their history. Um, so I think that that's something that we can really harness as a profession. For many individuals, families, and communities that are impacted by the War Climate Nexus, their stories are formative parts of their past, present, and future. So the opportunity to share, and the act of sharing itself provides a venue to highlight their voices and to encourage the elements of resettlement, rebuilding, and reestablishing. Um, due to the complexity of life and experience, telling one's story might include memories that evoke sadness, loss, stress, harm, and trauma. And most likely, it will evoke those, those emotions. Our stories are filled with those emotions, right? And the people we work with have, have very hard, hard, difficult things that they're talking about. But that doesn't mean that we, can, we, we shouldn't move forward and actually hear those stories. Um, there is a concern that retelling can result in re-traumatization. But there's been studies that actually show that the retelling might arise some distress short term, but in the long term, retelling in a safe and in a conversational context may actually be psychoeducational, relieving, and an important part of symptom reduction. Um, so in fact, the retelling of these distressing events combined with supportive, uh, supportive environments um, can actually be associated with, pro with positive outcomes. The last thing I want to talk about is policy, and then I'll, I'll wrap it up. Um, we have the capacity to provide leadership on climate advocacy and action. And we can uh, draw links between climate change and conflict, and so we can contribute to that policy discussion. We have a responsibility to advocate for environmental justice and to address um, these issues through education, advocacy, community outreach, and research. Um, in collaboration with the International Association of Schools of Social Work, the International Council on Social Welfare, the International Federation of Social Workers, and the Global Agenda, which some of you might be familiar with, the Global Agenda for Social Work and Social Development, instructs us to recognize how pressing environmental issues, such as natural resource depletion, environmental degradation, can undermine both people and planet and complicate our goal of achieving a just society. The Global Agenda calls for us to promote social and economic equality, promote the dignity and worth of people, work towards environmental sustainability, and recognize the importance of human relationships. The Global Agenda provides us with an advocacy framework, it's very useful, which we can use to respond to the war climate nexus while still addressing our core commitment to human rights and social justice. So I just want to emphasize that we do have this ethical responsibility under such guidelines as the Global Agenda to advocate for laws and policies that support vulnerable populations affected by these issues. And finally, the last point is that in order to address all of these complicated issues, we must facilitate collaboration at multiple levels. But the good news is that we are a profession that comfortably maneuvers among multiple systems and disciplines. We're really good at it, actually. So technical solutions, such as things like you know, reducing environmental degradation at sites of displacement or creating drought resistance crops, facilitating conflict resolution to address these issues are critical. But social solutions are actually equally important and oftentimes overlooked. Furthermore, an interdisciplinary lens is so important. And again, I think we're a profession that really works well with other professions, with other disciplines. 
and uh, working with other disciplines in the social and natural sciences, as well as practice communities around the globe in different countries who have different systems than we have here in Ontario, for example. Uh, you know, social service uh, workers in different countries are, have different guidelines and different requirements, but working together, I think, is a, a, real, uh, a real important way to um, prevent and address the impact of, of the issues that we've talked about today. Uh, one such uh, opportunity is the UN movement to prevent the exploitation of the environment in war and in armed conflict. And it offers an opportunity for us to engage in multidisciplinary partnerships with others who are committed to addressing the sustainable development goals. So we must encourage multidisciplinary thinking among our colleagues by shifting away from a siloized profession towards a networking profession and towards a profession that remains open to new and innovative solutions and collaboration. So as a profession, we've increasingly recognized that, social, that climate change and environmental degradation greatly impacts individuals, families, communities. And we also understand that what happens in one part of the world can impact us here in, in Ontario. Yet there's less recognition for the intersections between environmental issues and war, which results in a deleterious impact upon some of the world's most vulnerable populations. Fortunately, as a profession, we are well suited to address the complexity of this nexus. We meet people where they're at in order to better understand the adversities that they face and the strengths that they have available. We understand and see the value in the person and environment framework, which is a natural lens by which to examine the human relationship with the natural environment. We emphasize the voices of those most affected by adversity. We are agents of change. And we understand the importance of human relationships and collaboration in addressing some of the biggest issues facing our planet today. So there's a need for leadership within social work and social service work at all of these levels, theory, practice, and policy. And we have a responsibility to train the future generation of our profession to take up the challenge and to address the war climate nexus and all of its complexities, thereby joining a global community committed to addressing and ameliorating the pressing global crisis that we're facing. I'll end there. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Bree. That was excellent and very engaging. And we certainly have some questions coming in right now. And as I noted before the presentation, we will have our question period now. And it asks that attendees submit their questions through the chat feature to the right of the screen on the virtual portal. And we're going to do our best to answer as many questions as time permits. And we appreciate your understanding that we may not be able to get to all of the questions. So I'm going to start here with a question from Mihaela. And she's thanking you very much for sharing this presentation and the devastating realities that are happening around the world. And she's wondering how social workers and social service workers from Ontario best support and assist in the war climate nexus. Uh, she's a recent also graduate from Laurier, and she'd love to participate and assist, whether through policy work or hands-on approaches. Thanks so much for your question, Mahala. It's, um, I think my presentation was pretty broad in terms of what you can do. I tried to move between what you can do as a practitioner, what you can do kind of midterm and, and policy level and theoretically and things like that. Um, there's so many different things that we can do. I think one thing, and I, I hear this from my students and from people I talk to, is just how powerless we feel here. We're so far removed from some of the things that I talked about today. Um, but I would, challenge, I would challenge us to think we actually aren't that far removed. We live in, in, a multicultural, in multicultural communities, so our neighbors, our, our neighbors, our community members, people we meet on the street, they're coming from the places that I talked about today that are coming from places impacted by the war climate nexus. With that being said, as social workers, as social service workers, we are also working directly with these populations. Whether or not you're doing work that is, you know, working with refugees specifically or working with international populations, even if you're working with, um, you know, at a, a nursing home and with elderly, or if you're working at a school, you're going to come into contact with families that have experienced the, the war climate nexus. So that's where you can enact the practice element um, that I talked about today, which is things like um, helping helping families who are struggling to help reestablish, reconnect, create a sense of community. How can we do that as social workers and social service workers? 
others. Um, another element would be to listen to stories um, and to um, hear what people's experiences are. Um, I find that people um, really like to talk about their home country and about, about what they've left behind. Um, they want to share what that was like um, and oftentimes you know that the, the positive stories before they had to flee, before they had to leave. And then at a policy level, um, talking about, uh, you know, advoca advocacy elements, you know, working in government. I think, I think one of the most useful profession, uh, useful roles for social workers and social service workers is to be in policy, is to be in government, because that's where you can act kind of big systemic change. So um, making, drawing awareness to these issues at the government level so that um, uh, politicians and policymakers can actually make changes that will impact um, impact climate change. Um, I'll just give one example. I, I might get the details wrong, but at, from a policy perspective, um, Canada, Canada was uh, exporting waste, waste from, uh, from burning fuel, and they were exporting this, this waste product um, and exporting it to places like India, where um, they sell it for very cheap for people to use in their homes. Um, India also has a huge problem with pollution. Uh, I was in India a few years ago, and um, the pollution was so bad that my flight couldn't take off until the next day. So I was on the plane. They said, the pollution is so bad, we can't leave. You have to go stay at a hotel for a day until the pollution clears. So it's, it's very bad there at certain times of year. Um, and so I remember researching this and finding out that actually the Canadian government is exporting this really, really noxious, horrible, uh, terrible um, fuel kind of, um, uh, kind of waste to India and poor populations in India are actually purchasing that to survive, to cook, to heat their homes in the winter. Um, so, you know, that started me thinking, well, how can I advocate in Canada? How can I advocate on that level? And advocacy at that level could actually have an impact on uh, families, communities, and, and countries that are imp that are really impacted by you know like it's the pollution is very much present and real in their everyday lives. So that's just one example. But hopefully the presentation today, Mahala, has given you some um, some ideas maybe that I didn't even talk about about how we as as social workers and social service workers can address this issue. So thanks. Thank you, Bree. There's also been a lot of conversation as well uh, in the chat today, which has been great. So, so thank participation or participants from that. Um, and, and Nancy is just saying that it was a great presentation, being and having lived through the Brie, pardon me, having lived through the 14 years of civil war in Liberia, West Africa, and a refugee for 10 years in Accra, Ghana. I can attest to what you are saying. Um, and Roxanne also has thank you for acknowledging indigenous science knowledge and knowing as a viable solution for reconnection, restoration, and protection of the natural world and all beings in it. A question from Deborah is thank you so much for pointing out the ethical value of inviting research participants to tell stories, even though they may be difficult stories. Have you faced research ethics boards being concerned about this? And if so, what have you done to sensitize, address their concerns? This is one of my favorite questions, Deborah. <laughs> so I love talking about this because I, I find I found that that I, I'm a I'm a professor, so I teach students and I supervise students, and I hear from students when they're talking about doing research, they say, "Oh, I, I was going to do this, but I don't want to. I'm not going to do this. I'm not going to ask people directly about their experiences because it'll never get through REB. It'll never get through the university ethics." And I always I always you know stand up like, "No, do, you have to do it. You have to." pursue what you think is, is relevant and will help these populations. Um, and you are, I always recommend, I think that you, we can work with ethics boards and we have to uh, work alongside ethics boards to educate them on how, um, on how we do research and how these stories are important. So that's a, a little background of that. But it, to give you an example, it's absolutely, in my research, absolutely, we talk about difficult things in, in my research and I do get ethics approval for that. And the things that I do on my ethics applications is I, I talk about some of the things, I use some of the references that I used in my talk today. I talk about the value of stories and how um, there is more research that shows that, that stories can be valuable and that they can be healing. Um, the, the statistic that I cited about um, there, that there was a, a systematic review looking at the impact of, telling, of retelling and traumatization. There's an assumption that retelling re-traumatizes, but the American Psychological Association did a, a systematic review that found that that re-traumatization might be short-lived 
and that the long-term impact is actually very, very healing. So there's a lot of interesting research out there that you can use in an ethics application. But I really recommend we, we push our ethics we push our ethics um, boards to accept these kinds of, of uh, this, this kind of research because telling stories and sharing stories is such an important part of research. It's such an important, valuable part of research. And I think for the things that I was talking about today, it's especially, especially relevant. So we shouldn't be scared of that. We should be working with ethics boards to make sure that that is, is done. And I'll mention one other thing that we do do in, um, I just finished a study in Lebanon. Um, I wasn't able to go due to COVID, but I had a research team that was there. And they were talking uh, with mothers and fathers who've experienced pregnancy loss. So things like miscarriage, stillbirth, extremely intense conversations, extremely hard topic um, for the researchers and the families to go through. Um, the families, we, we expected hesitancy, we expected pushback or, or just people not wanting to talk. And of course, some people did not want to talk, but there were so many people who wanted to share their story. Um, there were so many people who came to our research team and, and would, would flag them down or WhatsApp them and say, I want it, can I be interviewed? I want to tell you about what happened to me. Um, and so in those cases, we tried to accommodate as many people as we could. We had more participants than we needed. So some participants we had to say, you know, we've actually reached our maximum. Uh, but it was really surprising that something that was so difficult to talk about, something that's very, very challenging for these families to talk about, that we had so many people who did want to talk about it. Um, in another research study I did, um, I, I usually tell the participants, according to our ethics, uh, our ethics um, guidelines, we usually use pseudonyms or we're, we, you know, it's anonymous, confidential, and, and, and all those elements of ethics. And I, I mentioned that to one of the fathers I was talking with in, in research study I was doing in, also in Lebanon. And he said, no, 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 use my name. I want you to use my name. <laughs> use my name because I want the world to know my story. I want, if I don't end up surviving, if my family doesn't end up surviving, I want there to be a record of me. I want there to be a record of my story. And that was really powerful, very, very powerful. And I've told that story, I've told that story to my ethics board and they've agreed that if, if a family, a participant wants to have their name, wants their story to be heard, then it should be, it should be heard. I think it's an ethical responsibility of us to do that. Thank you for the question. And yeah, Brie, like I said, there's a lot of really rich conversation happening on the chat, but unfortunately, you know, I think we, we're going to have to close it down for our last question, okay. but mm -hmm. there is a, a lot of interest in where people might be able to find further resources on this information. Oh, that's a good question. Uh, the, the internet, <laughs> the internet, <laughs> I'm just kidding. There's so many, uh, there's so many good resources out there. Um, if you want to read a bit more about, about my work and, and the, st the, the things that I've talked about today, I do have some publications that really capture, and then, and then the reference lists for those papers are, are rich with, with details that of, of you know, other authors, other researchers that you can look at, other websites and so forth. Um, I mean, this is a hard question because there's just so much good information out there. Um, I always recommend, I recommend my students and, and are always reading the news, reading about stories, getting as much information as possible, and assessing whether or not it's, it's good quality. Um, that's important as well. Um, a great source of information is just talking to people. And again, I'll talk about here, listening to stories and listening to people's um, experiences. Because what you might read on the internet or what you might read in a paper is gonna be very different than what people are experiencing themselves. Um, so I think that that's an important element is just chatting with people who are coming from, from different contexts, from different cultures, um, from different backgrounds and who've experienced um, this. I know some of the people who've written on the chat have actually experienced the war, ne war climate nexus. Um, so, you know, hearing those perspectives, hearing if those perspectives are different than what I've presented today would be really interesting as well. So I'm sorry I don't have like websites off the top of my head, but um, I'm happy if people reach out to me and uh, continue that conversation if anybody has pressing questions and I can give more specific resources if you're looking for it. So thank you so much. I'll end with that. Thanks. <laughs> I 
three, that was incredible. Thank you very much. Uh, this includes our educational session. And I'd like to thank Bree for such a powerful presentation. And I hope all attendees, and I can, I think, tell by the chat that all attendees found it both insightful and relevant. You know, I, I found it particularly relevant to social work and social service work practice by looking at the different theory, practice, and policy strategies that members may consider and employ. Um, and also taking a real interesting deep dive into what person environment means and perhaps applying that biophilia framework. Uh, so just really inf interesting insights for us all to go and reflect upon for some time. On behalf of the college, I'd like to present Bree with a token of our appreciation. The college has made a donation to the Gord Downey and Chenny Wenjack Fund, which aims to build cultural understanding and create a path towards reconciliation between Indigenous and non-Indigenous peoples. I'd also like to remind all attendees that you will receive an email in the next few days asking you to complete a post-event feedback form and to share your experience of this year's event. Once you complete the feedback form, you will have access to a link to the Certificate of Participation, which you can fill out and print for your records. As a general reminder about this year's AMED, if there are any sessions that you were unable to attend, rest assured that they are now accessible, on demand, for you to view at your leisure. This concludes this year's annual meeting and education day. Thank you for your participation. I hope that you were able to make the most of this two-day event. Thank you very much.